In this video, we're going to learn about using Table F, which is the Solubility Guidelines for Aqueous Solutions. Now, just as a reminder, an aqueous solution is a solution that basically is a solute that's dissolved in water. So when you see the abbreviation AQ in lower case next to a formula, it typically means that it's dissolved in water. So, uh, you know, for example, if I just go off here off the side, NaCl can be listed as a solid, but if I actually have it in a solution, if it's salt water, NaCl that's dissolved, NaCl AQ could be a final product. And so, again, that AQ references aqueous, and again, aqueous represents something that's dissolved in water. Now, how we actually interpret this chart, there's two sides to the table. The left side are materials that are soluble in water, and the right side are materials that are insoluble, meaning that they're not soluble, they don't have the ability to dissolve very well. But in both cases, notice there's a second column of exceptions. There's a lot more exceptions over here because a lot of this stuff really relates to stuff that's on this side. So for example, if we look here, we see group one elements, we, send, we see NH4. I go over there, there's group one elements, there's NH4. We see calcium and magnesium. Um, you know, calcium and magnesium are group two elements. So oftentimes those are often gonna be uh, an exception as well. Again, all the way down, we see group one, group one, group one, we have NH4. And then some of the select group two elements. So, for example, these materials, for example, carbonates, chromates, phosphates, sulfides, hydroxides, they typically don't dissolve very well in water unless they are bonded to something else. If they're bonded to a group one element, then that's an exception. That means they will be soluble. Where the opposite's true over here on the left side, typically all group one elements are soluble. They'll dissolve. And notice there's no exceptions for a lot of these. Ammonium, okay, it doesn't matter what ammonium is bonded to, it's gonna dissolve, it's gonna break apart. Nitrates will all dissolve, acetates will all dissolve, uh, hydrogen carbonate dissolves and chlorate dissolves. Your halides, halides again are your halogens, chlorine, bromine, and iodine from group 17. They typically will all dissolve. One of the most common ones I just drew on this previous paper here, NaCl, sodium chloride, which of course is a group one element, and of course the halide. However, there's a couple exceptions. If chlorine, bromine, or iodine is bonded to silver, to lead, or to mercury, in this case, it's actually dimercury, then there's an exception and they will not dissolve. And what they form instead is something known as a precipitate. Uh, you see the symbol PPT, that usually means it's a solid and will come out of solution where you might have two clear liquids and you mix them together and all of a sudden you see sediment and you see stuff start to you know look like it's snowing basically in your solution and all settling to the bottom. And then again, the last one, all sulfates are soluble, again with the exception, and a lot of these are the same exceptions. Silver, in this case we have again uh, lead, silver and lead, but notice we have calcium, strontium, and barium. So the interesting thing in this case if the sulfate is bonded to calcium, strontium, and barium, it forms something that's not soluble, but some of these other ones forms things that are soluble. So you have to be very careful when you're paying attention, or excuse me, and pay attention to what your materials are looking for. Now, when you're doing the equations for table F and to see if they're soluble or just to predict whether or not a precipitate will form, it's basically going to be a double replacement reaction. So we're gonna do a couple, just I'm gonna practice and kind of walk you through here. And we'll try to keep, see if we can keep everything on the chart. It says if I have solutions of sodium phosphate and calcium chromate and mix them, what a precipitate form? And again, like I just said, write out the double replacement reaction and show all the solubilities. Now, you can go through and actually do the formulas and do a balanced equation, but for the sake of this activity, you really don't need to. It doesn't need to be balanced, so it doesn't necessarily need to be quantitative. It's more of a qualitative thing. You're actually gonna visualize or see what's happening. If you were to pour the two together, it doesn't really matter if I have a huge quantity or a small quantity, I'll see the results uh, if it's actually going to form a precipitate. So we wanna write this out. We're gonna do sodium phosphate. And we have calcium chromate. And remember, all of these things that end in ATE and ITE, like phosphate and chromate, you can find on table E. 
And there's other things, of course, that could be uh, available, but a lot of times if you're looking at things that end in ATE or ITE, find them on table E. There are some exceptions here, like hydronium, we have, you know, we have mercury, or mercury one, we have hydrogen sulf, you know, there's things with multiple words, so on and so forth, but we have hydroxide, peroxide, cyanide. There are some IDE endings, but usually your IDE endings are found on the periodic table. ATE, ITE, find it on table E. And as a reminder, with your double replacement, remember the parts just change positions. They change partners. So the first part is usually your positive piece. The second part is your negative piece. So we have positive, negative, and then I'd have a positive and negative. What they're gonna do, they're just gonna switch. So those two are gonna go together, and then these two are gonna go together. So your insides will kind of replace, you know, the calcium, which is positive, and the phosphate, which is negative. We're gonna have calcium phosphate and then we're gonna have sodium and chromate. Now, one of the other things you need to kind of go into this with is that usually it would make sense that your teacher or the state would give you two things that are soluble in the first place, because otherwise it wouldn't make sense. If I can't dissolve it, then I can't mix it with something else and form a new material. But if we just take a look at this again, because sodium is a group one, that all sodium things are soluble, this of course is gonna be soluble, just to again, make sure that we're following through. And calcium chromate, when we look and find chromate, notice chromate is over here. So chromate would be insoluble, but the exception is when it's bonded to calcium. So this is also soluble. So now we gotta go back and look at the other examples. Group one, again, anything with group one is gonna be soluble. So when I switch to sodium chromate, again, sodium is there, the chromate, also again when combined with group one. So that's a soluble material because that's makes that's an exception. Okay, these are exceptions to the rules. Most chromates are insoluble except when they're bonded to certain things. If we find the phosphate, we're gonna bond it or we're bonded to calcium. So notice phosphate is insoluble. However, if it's bonded to group one or ammonia, it's not, which is what we started with, but right here calcium is not in that group, okay? Calcium does not fit this exception, so this is actually insoluble. And this would be our PPT or our precipitate. So this would form a precipitate in this case. So again, all you need to do is find and do your double replacement first, just switch the two names around. So again, the inside or the, you know, the, the ending part, the negative piece goes with the first one of the other value, which is the positive piece. And then this first positive piece goes with the other negative piece. And so again, we're, double replacement reactions switch both partners. And so if we take a look at a couple others here, see if we can try to keep both in the view. Mercury two chloride and uh, potassium sulfide. So when we go through again, we're just gonna switch those positions. So we're gonna have mercury sulfide or mercury two sulfide and potassium chloride. So we're gonna make sure again, we switch the positions of both of those. Again, the halogens in this case, right here, mercury two chloride, um, in this one, where did we go here? I want to think maybe there's an error here. Oh yeah, that because that other one is dimercury, correct? So notice this is dimercury, not the normal uh, mercury. This is dimercury, so be careful. I know it's a little hard to see because this has been faded. Um, so this is dimercury, not the regular mercury. So notice dimercury is listed as the exception, but not this one. So this is t still, because it's a halide with chlorine, that one's gonna be soluble. We'll just put a little S there to keep it simple. Potassium sulfide. If we find the sulfides, the sulfides are all insoluble except with group one. Potassium is a group one element. So again, that is going to be, again, soluble. But if we do mercury sulfide, notice mercury is not one of the exceptions here. So this one will all also be insoluble. We can use a letter I and there's our PPT right there, where potassium chloride again brings us over to the chlorides. It's group one. So we have both the group one rule and we have the halide rule with the chloride. So this is also soluble. All right, sodium bicarbonate and calcium chloride. We're just gonna switch those partners around. We're gonna have calcium 
bicarbonate and sodium chloride. Now the bicarbonate is basically the same thing as hydrogen carbonate. And so notice our hydrogen carbonates, there's no exceptions. So both this one is gonna be soluble and this one's gonna be soluble. They're both gonna be soluble. Chlorides, because the chlorides are in the halogen group, there are some exceptions, but we have calcium, which is not one of the exceptions over here. So that means it's going to be soluble. And then we have a group one element. And so any of the group one elements, again, are gonna be soluble. So in this case, there are some times where all the reactions will result in no precipitate forming. Okay, so this one had a precipitate form, this one did not. And then our last one, copper chloride with ammonium phosphate, we're gonna form uh, copper phosphate and ammonium chloride. And again, we've seen that idea that the chlorides uh, are all, uh, again, soluble. The exceptions would be silver, lead, and dimercury. And so that's neither of these. And so we have copper chloride and we have, uh, sorry, ammonium chloride over here. Those are not in the exceptions, so they're gonna stay soluble. And then when we look at the phosphates, our phosphates are over here. Ammonium is one of the exceptions, so that's why we were originally able to have something that was dissolved, but then copper phosphate is not in that exception group. So we would have something that's insoluble, that's gonna be our PPT. And so one of the reasons and where this comes into play and how this is beneficial is if you have a company that's just dumping stuff into a lake, uh, where I teach is Onondaga Lake, and it's one of the most polluted lakes in the country, if not one of the most polluted lakes in the world. And it's been, you know, they've been cleaning it up over the years, but it's still never going to clean everything up. And so companies would dump materials and waste stuff in there year after year after year. They had waste beds that leached into the lake. And so one reason after another, you know, maybe it's a material that's soluble and they can, you know, pour it into a water stream or into a creek and think that they're diluting it. But if, if they're also dumping other chemicals at a later point, Point, or if another company is, is dumping another chemical on the other side of the lake, now these two chemicals can combine and they start to have an interaction and they form silo precipitates, which will settle to the bottom and then maybe bottom feeders, you know, different plants take this up and then you get bioaccumulation of certain materials through, uh, you know, through the environment and, and just through the ecology and what's going on through the food chain and you end up having uh, you know, maybe higher peak organisms start to have higher levels of certain materials just because of what was possibly a soluble material then formed something else that wasn't soluble and they consumed it over time. So again, that's basically how you read and uh, access and interpret table F. We have a soluble side. These are things that will dissolve in water. These insoluble ones do not dissolve in water, but in both cases, there's exceptions. And again, if you notice, the exceptions on this side are ma mainly the ones that are soluble over here. So again, group one, group one, group one, group one, and ammonia, NH4 is ammonia. Notice those are the first two. So anything with ammonia is going to be soluble, even if it's these that typically are not. But if these are bonded to other things, then again, they would typically stay insoluble. You know, you could pour them in water and they wouldn't dissolve. They might just sink to the bottom and they're just gonna be part of that system for a long time. And again, there are some exceptions to the soluble ones too. Most chlorides, the halogens, you know, sodium chloride is the biggest one we're familiar with and talk about all year. Um, but sodium bromide, sodium iodide, these are all sodium materials, but just the halides from group 17, most of them are going to be soluble, but there are some exceptions. So silver chloride, uh, you know, lead, any lead product you have to be really careful of. We, we've done demonstrations with lead iodide and it forms that brilliant yellow color when I take two solutions together uh, and it forms a brilliant yellow color with lead iodide. And then we have the dimercury as well. So again, that's how you read table F. Hopefully you have found some benefit to that and I will like I look forward to seeing your success uh, with Table F and solutions in the future. Take care.